Welcome to uh, video two in the coaching series, Coaching Beyond the X's and O's. Uh, today, what I'd like to do is I'd like to uh, share uh, uh, the maybe the impetus, the origins behind this video series, uh, a book called The Fifth Discipline written by Peter Senge. Uh, and then what I would like to do is I would like to attach uh, that book to the story that I started in video one about uh, baseball integrating. So the fifth discipline talks about five things that Peter Senge believes are critical to great organizations, great teams. Uh, the first three we're not going to talk about. The first three are personal to every coach and his program, shared vision, team learning, personal mastery. Super important, uh, but I don't believe this video series should focus on that. What I do believe it should focus on and what I'm hopeful I can do is communicate the value of mental models and system thinking. So when I came across this, uh, I started to reevaluate how it is that I coach and how it is that I communicate. And I realized that the value of the mental model is very much, uh, it's very much like an architect or someone that's trying to frame a house. Like when you frame a house and you create a model, you don't think about those benign conditions, those, those calm days. You think about the days that literally could tear down a structure. So what we want to do as coaches, we're going to create models that can sustain us in the hardest of times, those, those, those things that, uh, that just eat at us and, and uh, consume our thinking, the conflict with, with parents and, and teammates and, and things of that nature. So I think mental models really can help uh, frame the way we think of things as we, as we navigate the world that we're supposed to lead. And the other one is systems thinking, and systems thinking is, is mostly just recognizing that uh, we are a part to a whole, that our sport doesn't exist independent of our athletes' lives, our sport doesn't exist independent of other sports that uh, potentially uh, work in a building environment. So uh, this was the idea of the fifth discipline. And I would like to just share three mental models that, uh, that, that I use, that I trust, in helping me navigate the athletes that I coach uh, and the coaches that I interact with. And, and I should be, uh, should, should be remiss in also mentioning the parents too, okay? So uh, the first mental model I'm gonna talk about is what I call the intentional door. Um, so the, the way I see it is I see it as a, a three door system where the first door is the actual door. All of us know that we can't influence people if we can't get them in our presence, we need them at our practices, we need them at our events. That's the actual door. The second door is the attentional door, right? We, we crave their eyes. Their eyes tell us that they're, uh, at, at a minimum, it, it looks like they're willing to listen to us. Uh, but the last door is the magic door. The last door is what I call the intentional door. And, and I'll, often you'll hear me say intent precedes content. Uh, with respect to Branch Rickey and Jackie Robinson, uh, those two folks were courageous at their core. Uh, Branch Rickey was about to entertain the idea of breaking down the color barrier. It takes an uh, incredible amount of courage to go against 15 other baseball owners and do something that most didn't think was even possible. But Branch Rickey had a ton of courage. Of course, Jackie Robinson had a ton of courage. I believe in video one, I mentioned uh, that um, you know he refused to go to the back of the bus um, and he, he was certainly not going to listen to other people's opinions, uh, especially uh, white folk that were going to tell him, uh, a black athlete, how to, how to respond. And, and the famous interaction, of course, was uh, Jackie Robinson asked Branch Rickey. Uh, Branch, Branch said that you, you can't respond to all the threats and all the, the vile comments. And Jackie at first was like, you want someone to just take that? And then Branch Rickey, of course, uh, appealing to, the, to Jackie Robinson's courage said, I want someone with the courage to not respond, right? And then that interaction led Jackie Robinson to realize that Branch Rickey was in fact the person that was gonna help break the color barrier. But J Branch Rickey doesn't appeal to Jackie Robinson without appealing to the, to the courage of the man, okay? So that's something that I believe the intentional door uh, at, at the heart of every person is something that they hold deep to themselves, this, this value, their morals, and Jackie Robinson certainly had courage at his, at his foundation. Uh, now, the next one I wanna talk about, now this isn't my model, but I like it. Uh, I'm gonna talk about Bill Veck. Uh, Bill Veck 
was the owner of the Cleveland Indians uh, in the story that I told. Uh, he was the owner that brought Larry Doby to, to the American League, uh, and he was the owner that paid F. A. Manley uh, for Larry Doby. Okay, so a self-fulfilling prophecy and something that we so struggle with with our athletes is trying to break this cycle, right? A feedback loop of behavior and beliefs, behavior and beliefs. So what so often happens is, is we see some sort of behavior and then we form beliefs around that behavior. So with respect to Bill Vec, uh, Bill Vec's behavior was, he was a super creative guy. He, he, he believed, okay, he believed that the nature of sport was about giving fans the, the, the best experience possible. And in doing so, uh, he, he had a midget show up and play, uh, he had disco nights and he had water fountains in the in the stands and and he was just all about giving these these fans an experience right and and he believed that you know that that getting people into the stands and and, and a night at the ballpark was was a, was as much about the fan experience as it was about what was on between the lines so that was that was how he interacted that was how he demonstrated his belief with this behavior. Well, the belief that the other owners uh, they experienced was very much like the Savannah Bananas now or uh, the Harlem Globetrotters. They thought it was a gimmick. They thought that the integrity of the sport was being compromised by, by Bill Vec's behavior. So they thought Vec was a clown. Um, uh, so much so that when, when Bill Vec actually wanted to integrate uh, the the sport well before Branch Rickey the, the the owners blocked him Judge Judge Landis blocked him right so uh, the owners had a belief based on his behavior uh, and then as I said the owners behavior was they they refused to grant uh, Vec any opportunities like he was a clown he was he was he uh, you know the, the owners collectively their behavior prevented Bill Vec many opportunities in fact. Uh, when the St. Louis Browns wanted to move to Baltimore in 1954, uh, the, the, the condition was they can move to Baltimore so long as Bill Veck isn't the owner. That's how much the owners despise Bill Veck and his gimmicks. And yet Bill Veck, uh, in, in many ways, was a super kind-hearted man. Uh, and then Bill Veck's, of course, belief was, well, if all of these owners are selfish, if all they care about is their pocketbooks, if they don't care about the fans, then, then I don't really care about them. And then that sort of created his beliefs again and demonstrated his behavior, right? Why was he willing to pay F. A. Manley? Because others weren't. Branch Rickey had demonstrated that he was just gonna take Negro League players, whereas Bill Vex said, that's not right. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not selfish like them. People deserve to be paid uh, for, their, for, their, for their players. So uh, the self-fulfilling prophecy, and, and the, the reason I wanna share this is because in order to break the cycle. Many times it is incumbent on the leader, the coach, to dig deeper as to why athletes behave the way they behave. Why do parents behave the way they behave? Uh, otherwise, we just grab this low-hanging fruit and we cannot get out of this vicious cycle of, uh, of this feedback loop called the self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay, uh, The last one I want to talk about is with respect to Judge Kennesaw Mount Landis. Uh, this is something that, that I call the anchoring quotient. Uh, basically, it's, it's a way that I've come to believe the biases that, that people have. And uh, I created through like this seesaw lens where we have these top-down pressures and then we have these bottom-up influences and it sort of biases us to one side or the other. So uh, his name was, was Kennesaw Mountain Landis, but he's referred to as Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis because before he was baseball commissioner, he was a federal judge appointed by Teddy Roosevelt, but uh, he existed during Woodrow Wilson's time. Woodrow Wilson was a segregationist. He, he is perceived as being um, someone that, that uh, over time didn't do our country, didn't do our country right. Uh, he promoted these segregationist beliefs. Uh, one of my beliefs is when you look at people and why they believe what they believe, look at how many like-minded friends they have around them. What, what, what environment are they growing up in? Uh, and Judge Kennesaw Mount Landis was growing up in a presidency. He was, he existed in a presidency that actually supported his views. 
All right, so over time we look back on, on Landis and we say, what a, what a miserable human being, what a vile person to prevent uh, this, uh, this integration. But at the time it was actually common in, in the country to actually uh, purport those views. Uh, sunk costs. So he was a judge, and judges uh, work in the rearview mirror, right? They they have something that they call uh, stare decisis, which basically says, you know, we just we just go with the status quo. We're not going to overturn precedent, and so all through time, uh, he was constantly uh, uh, he was he was referring to to past cases and. If you're the commissioner of Major League Baseball and you've never seen a black athlete, why would you be the first one to allow a black athlete, right? That's the judge's mindset. Uh, and I would call those sunk costs. He had, as a judge, he had demonstrated time and time again that he was going to defer to the to precedent, to precedent. And uh, I don't think Kennesaw Mountain Landis was the guy to ever break the color barrier. Uh, it required his death. Uh, and the last thing is, is um, the number of things that you have seen. Well, he had never seen uh, a, a black athlete before. Why would, why would he do it again? And so often uh, we are biased to what it is that we see. And as a leader, as a coach, right, we have to constantly reflect on um, are the things that I'm seeing, are they true or are they just true in my world, right? And uh, I'm not gonna talk about the bottom-up influences, uh, but in my in my model, I have bottom up influences as much as top down influences, right? And and I believe that all of us are biased. All of us are biased in one way or the other. Uh, and when you see it like this, and you see it about the people that you hang out with, right? We all know that uh, when when you're evaluating athletes, when you're evaluating parents, when you're evaluating assistant coaches, right? We know they don't exist in a vacuum. We know that they're influenced with peer pressure and the people that surround them. Uh, we know that, that so many of them uh, are afraid to change their beliefs because their beliefs form their identity. Uh, and and it's, it's, you know, there's a phrase they say, what gets in early gets in deep. Uh, and we know that they're a function of their experiences. So why wouldn't they have biases depending on where they've grown up and what they've seen? So anyway, uh, video series two. Uh, this series is going to be talking about mental models. The models are only going to be shared in ways that they can help us coach, lead our teams, uh, understand the people that, that we're in charge of, understand the parents that we interact with, understand, uh, try to try to better understand everyone that surrounds us. Uh, and then these two things will be shared in conjunction as we continue through this series. But uh, the value of a mental model uh, is designed to, to fortify us in the hardest of times. And I just wanted to share three uh, as an example of what you can see coming forward, uh, a preview of coming attractions.